paper uh, this morning is on the Heidelberg Catechism and the Means of Grace, and uh, I have so uh, been encouraged and benefited by all uh, of the papers that have been delivered uh, thus far, and I think a lot of them uh, really speak to our our subject uh, this morning. I I would love to uh, to hear a lecture or to write a lecture on how all of the different things that have been said already really come together in this, this uh, theme of the means of grace and how important they are for the church. I want to begin by asking you to uh, imagine with me for a moment a wealthy, young, German nobleman from centuries past who wanted to build the most magnificent and stately home in the land. To accomplish this, the nobleman sought out a highly esteemed architect to draw up the plans, and also uh, the most prominent builder in the land to build the building. After the blueprints were complete, the architect called a meeting. As he went over the plans, the nobleman was very pleased. It was exactly what he envisioned. The architect explained that a house of this size and with this kind of craftsmanship would take at least 15 years to build and that it was absolutely cr uh, critical that the proper tools and the proper materials were used to construct this building as specified in the blueprint. To use unsuitable tools and substandard materials would compromise the entire project. The nobleman was pleased with everything that he had heard, for he wanted this home to be in his family for generations. After construction began, however, the young nobleman had received news from a faraway land that he uh, had to leave, and he was going to be gone probably for many, many years. He would thus have to completely entrust the project to the builder and to his sons. After five years, a lot of progress had been made, some good things had been done, and things were going according to plan, but the main builder got sick and died, and so his oldest son took over the project, but he was not as careful to follow the blueprint as his father was. He began using newer tools. He began using cheaper materials in order to get the job done faster. After a couple of years, the oldest brother also died, and so his younger brother took over the job. Like his older brother, he cut corners, and he strayed even further from the blueprint that had been set forth many years before. In fact, it had been so long that he'd seen the young nobleman that he had begun taking many liberties with the project, and he used ill-suited tools and shoddy building materials, and he made additions and omissions to the blueprint. It wasn't part of the original plan. Because of his innovation and shortcuts, the project was completed a few years early, even. <coughs> the young nobleman was contacted, and he was told, the project is finished, you need to come home, and and so he began his long journey home. He was excited to finally see this stately residence that had been built for him and for his family. But when he arrived, he was disturbed to see that what was drawn out on the blueprint, what he saw before he left, and what he had envisioned was not what was before him. It was clear that the builders had drifted away from the blueprint by cutting corners, by making innovations, by using unapproved tools and materials. Rather than trust the knowledge and wisdom of the architect in sticking to his original plan, the young builders did what they thought was best, and it compromised everything. The house was so poorly built, it was almost unrecognizable to the nobleman. Well, dear friends, it's not hard to see how this little story uh, relates to our subject for this morning. Christ is building his church. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, Matthew 16. Christ is building his church, and he is doing it through his chosen and approved instruments and means, according to his word. But too often, too often, we who are his instruments, we who are his ministers, stray away from the blueprint found in his word. As builders, we begin cutting corners. We begin using unapproved means in the building process. We begin putting 
confidence in and focusing upon other means besides the means that he has provided for the building of his church. By thinking that we are wiser than God, we compromise the entire project, if we can call the building of the church a project. Christ is building his church. And he is doing so through instruments and with materials that are sovereignly appointed and approved by him. This should not come as a surprise to us, friends. Jesus is Lord and King over his church. And so he makes the rules. We should be happy for that. He knows what is best for us. And as a good shepherd, he wants to ensure the ingathering, growth, comfort, protection, and blessing of his flock. So what are those instruments and materials that he has promised to use and bless? Well, they are lawfully ordained ministers of the word of God and the means of grace. That is the means of the preaching of the word of God and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. It is through God's appointed ministers and with God's appointed means, all in the context of the local church, that he has promised to save and to sanctify and preserve those for whom Christ died. Beloved, this is God's original blueprint and construction plan for the church. This is his blueprint for expanding his kingdom, his strategy. This is his divine strategy for saving his people. But again, like the builder's sons, we often stray from this divine blueprint and come up with our own design, our own tools, our own materials. We become dissatisfied with what God has given us. Surely there's another way to make the church grow faster. We lack confidence in what God himself has promised to bless. At the end of the day, we must ask, do we believe God when he says, I will use my word to bless the church? Like the ancient Israelites, we are no longer satisfied with the manna. We complain, we want something more, something more exciting, more amusing, more culturally relevant, more palatable to modern tastes. Even in Reformed congregations, we do this. We come up with our own means of grace, don't we? That which we think will do a better job. These alternative means of grace are often found in what I would call the 21st century new measures. What would they be? The praise band would be one. Uh, we could, uh, I think that's the prominent one, but we could also, the pendulum can swing the other way, and it can be this, uh, this traditional classical music that takes over the entire service. I'll never forget uh, one time being, um, I was, uh, a church had come and had expressed interest in, in me being their pastor, this is five or six years ago, and I began asking about the worship service, and uh, it, they were saying, oh, we've got this wonderful music director, and we have all this music, and this and that. Well, how long do I have to preach? Oh, you'll have 20 minutes to preach. So this conversation's finished. <laughs> Classical music can take over services as well. We have the new measures of drama, uh, anecdote-driven preaching, personal testimonies by the laity. We think that these means will somehow better communicate the gospel in our modern context. But what our Reformed forefathers understood, and what we must be reminded of today, is that God has not only revealed in his word the message of the gospel, but he has also revealed in his word the sovereignly appointed method of communicating that gospel, namely through the word and sacraments. He has given us the message he has also given us the methods in the way that message should be delivered. And we'll see why that's so important in a few minutes. According to his divine prerogative and wisdom, God ordains specific means in order to accomplish at least three specific purposes. Here's the first one. To faithfully proclaim and reinforce the true message of the gospel. To faithfully proclaim and reinforce the true message of the gospel. Friends, the good news of the gospel is meant to be an announcement. It is meant to be proclaimed. It is good news. In fact, it's the best news that's ever been given. Ministers are called to be ambassadors of King Jesus, commissioned to proclaim this message of salvation to the church and to the nations. They are to preach God's word, 
Not their own words, but the word of Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.20 that they were ambassadors for Christ. Listen, God making his appeal through us. Churches are embassies of grace. The gospel is always the front page news uh, in the church. Always the front page news. This is precisely, it's precisely when the word is faithfully preached and the baptismal waters are are poured out, properly uh, understood and explained, and when the bread is broken and the wine is poured out, uh, that the gospel is most clearly and effectually communicated to the elect by the Spirit and through faith. It is through the means of grace that disciples are made. We learn this from the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We see it right there, the strategy for the church, and the means of grace. Go therefore and make disciples. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them what that baptism means is all a part of that. And then uh, uh, teaching them all that I have commanded. And I will be with you even into the end of the age. The Holy Spirit creates and nourishes faith in the preaching of the word. And he confirms it in the sacraments. He teaches us in the preaching of the gospel and he assures us in the administration of the sacraments. Let me put it this way. God is at work by his spirit through the means of grace. This is what God has promised. Through his word, the spirit is actively regenerating, convicting, sanctifying, comforting, disciplining, and encouraging those for whom Christ died. We need to get that into our minds. It's not just uh, some activity like any other activity of the church. When we gather together for corporate worship on a holy day, God's set-apart ministers with these holy ordinances, God is at work by His Spirit through these things. The means of grace drive us to Christ. And the Reformed have always emphasized this. How do our catechism emphasizes this? We see in Lord's Day 25, question 67. Question 67. The question is, are both the word and sacraments then ordained, listen to this language, ordained and appointed for this end that they may direct our faith to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? The means of grace, the word and the sacraments are appointed approved and ordained for this end, that they may direct our faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not left up to to us to figure out how to direct people to the Lord Jesus Christ in our churches. It is through the word and sacraments. Paul teaches in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ. Beloved, when we by faith hear and receive the good news of the gospel every Lord's Day through the preached word and the sacraments, our faith in Christ is strengthened. Our hearts are increasingly assured and comforted in our Father's love and our lives are increasingly adorned with grateful obedience. That's what happens when we are faithful to set forth the means of grace in our churches. This is what happens by the Spirit and through faith. So that's the first reason God specifically ordained preaching and sacraments for His church, to faithfully proclaim and to reinforce the gospel of Jesus Christ. We marginalize and distort the gospel when the means of grace are not central. The second reason that God ordained specific means is is to communicate to the elect the mediatorial benefits of Christ through the instrument of faith. It's a mouthful. Let me say that again. To communicate to the elect the mediatorial benefits of Christ through the instrument of faith. This, of course, is uh, intimately related to the first point. But it makes uh, a separate and important point, doesn't it? The question we must ask is this. Christ lived, died, and rose again, and ascended into heaven 2,000 years ago. He is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So as John Owen asked in his 1667 Catechism on Worship, 
as Martin Bucer asked in 1538 in, in his uh, concerning the care of souls, a kind of pastoral theology. He, they, they both asked this question. How is it that Christ is up there and we get his grace down here? How is it that Christ lived, died, rose, and ascended 2,000 years ago? He's in heaven now. How is it that I gain from him as a sinner, a rebellious sinner? How is it that I gain from him? How do I, re- I receive his grace? How do we receive Christ's righteousness, forgiveness, mercy, and love? The answer is, God's grace is ordinarily received by us and applied to us by the working of the Holy Spirit through faith by the objective ministry of the Word and sacraments. This is what the framers of the Heidelberg Catechism once again teach us in question answer 65, don't they? Since then, faith alone makes us share in Christ and all his benefits. Where does this faith come from? Listen to the language. Since then, faith alone makes us share in Christ and all of his benefits. This is how we share in Christ and all of his benefits. Answer, this comes from the Holy Spirit who works faith in our hearts. How? By the preaching of the gospel and strengthens or confirms it by the use of the sacraments. In his shorter catechism, uh, which has been um, mentioned several times already this weekend, Uh, written the year before in 1562, Ursinus asks in question 53, by what means and instruments does the Holy Spirit work, nurture, and confirm faith in us? Answer, through the preaching of the word and the use of the sacraments. A hundred years later, our own Westminster uh, standards uh, in our our tradition, uh, the more superior Reformed tradition, um, (laughs) Question 88. Do I hear an amen out there? Thank you. Where are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? (laughs) It's a question we all need to answer. What are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us, delivers to us, the benefits of his redemption? Answer, the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, sacraments, and prayer, all which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. Some interesting discussion on whether or not prayer belongs uh, in that answer. Uh, We could talk about that more later. God has chosen to use the outward and objective ministry of the preached word and sacraments to save gather and perfect his elect. This is precisely why the Westminster Divines wrote in Westminster Confession of Faith 25 that outside of the visible church there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. There is no ordinary ordinary possibility of salvation. Calvin says the same in Institutes 4 and uh, 4.1 one. Uh, Ursinus, in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, question 54. Uh, I was wondering if Ursinus commented on this very topic of whether people can, can be saved outside of the ministry of, of the church. And, and there was actually a, a, a title there that said, they asked the question, how can a person be saved outside of the ministry of the church? And he, he answers, no one can be saved outside of the church. He gives two reasons. Because out of the church there is no Savior and hence no salvation. <clears throat> Two, because those whom God has chosen to the end, which is eternal life, them he has also chosen to the means, which consist in the inward and outward call. Hence, although the elect are not always members of the visible church, yet they all become such before they die. Now, again, there is ordinarily no possibility of salvation outside of the church. We know there are certain circumstances that happen. Someone gets converted by a preacher and then ends up living in a jungle somewhere. I would, I would say this. I get the question all the time. What am I supposed to do? We, we, I, I have no good church in the area. Well, if, if, if beginning a church is not a possibility, what should you do? Move. move. We have no problem moving when we get a pay raise. Oh, I've got to move. I mean, they're going to pay me $25,000 more a year. Of course I've got to move to this other city. Is there a good church there? Well, I hadn't really checked. You're kidding me. What's the most important thing in your life and you haven't checked? We move for all kinds of reasons. I want to live in a more beautiful place. I want to make more money. What about the church? 
I'll never forget hearing John MacArthur uh, bring this up. When I was in college, many years ago, he brought this up in a sermon. I'll never forget it. He talked about how many people have moved to Sun Valley, California in order to worship in a church where the word is being preached. And, and uh, we should probably see more of that happening today amongst the Reformed. Why would we not want to sit under the faithful proclamation of the word in our lives? Why would we want to live somewhere where that was not happening if we could help it? So, all this to say, the end for God's elect is heaven. But the means of getting them there is the proclamation of the gospel and the spiritual shepherding through word and sacraments. Ordinarily, there is no possibility of someone being a Christian apart from the means of grace. For these are the very means that Christ instituted in order to communicate his benefits of redemption to his elect. So the means of grace faithfully proclaim and reinforce the true message of the gospel. By the Spirit, through faith, they effectually communicate the mediatorial benefits of Christ. And thirdly, this is glorious, they inspire God-centered boasting. They inspire God-centered boasting. When lives are transformed by Christ through the foolishness of preaching and the sacraments, there is no question about who gets the glory. This is one of the main points of the opening chapter of 1 Corinthians, and we can find this point spread all throughout Scripture. But listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 18-31. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God, listen to this, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And it's not only the message of the cross that's being spoken of there as the weakness, but also the method of bringing this message, which is preaching. And we see this in the book of Acts, don't we? We see these concentric circles of the spreading of the gospel, both demographically and geographically. And what do we have at each stage, at each stage of the outline of Acts, and from the front and the middle and the end, we have the word of God was increasing, and many were being converted, and people were being added to the church, and it was the word of the Lord being preached. Oh, well, John, we have better ways to communicate the gospel today, because in the first century, they liked preaching, and they didn't like drama. (laughs) They loved drama in the first century. Every century has loved drama. Every century has loved some form of entertainment. But it is through the foolishness of preaching. And because it is a a message that must be proclaimed, it is an announcement that God has saved his people through the work of Christ. That we must keep the means of grace central. Paul goes on to say, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Friends, our Reformed forebears believed this. They believed it. And so they put their confidence not in man-made techniques and strategies, but in the God-ordained foolishness of word-centered preaching and sacraments, believing them to be the power of God into salvation, and that which would most faithfully extol the wisdom, grace, and glory of God. This is why they spent so much time debating the sacraments in particular, and the authority of the word of God, because they believed in these things and how important they were for the church. And let us keep in mind that while Ursinus, Olivianus, and the rest of the theological faculty and church superintendents were busy crafting and overseeing the Heidelberg Catechism in the early 1560s, there were, just like today, various theological pitfalls that needed to be avoided, just like they do today. You can draw the lines. On one side, you had the radical Anabaptists, 
who in large part were suspicious of the outward and objective ministry of the church. And so they focused upon the private, inner, subjective experience of faith. Sound familiar? It sounds like evangelicalism in America. One of the most popular books, in fact, I just saw it in a family member's home. It's called Jesus Calling. I hope I don't step on any toes too bad this morning. Maybe you have this in your, in your bag. I mean, thousands of people have this. And in the very beginning of this book, she says, I had my Bible, but I needed something more. She says it right there. And then she goes on to say that I started having private meetings with Jesus and he began speaking to me. And this book is the, the, the outworking of these private conversations with Jesus. And it sold like a gazillion copies. You know, you want to sell some books? Have a meeting with God. Let him tell you some things. Market it well. Or go to heaven for five minutes and come back and write a book about it. <laughs> Make millions. I'm not thinking about doing that, by the way. Don't encourage you to either. But this is what the Anabaptists were doing. They did not get the vital and necessary connection between the spirit and the external word. On the other hand, you had the Roman Catholics, who were sacerdotalists, focusing almost exclusively upon the objective work of the priests at the font and at the altar, to the exclusion of the exercising of faith and the necessary work of the Spirit. It could be argued that in both of these settings, sinners were required to work their way up to God, an impossibility. The person and finished work of Christ was not enough for them. But the means of grace faithfully administered and rightly understood, underscore the biblical truth that God has come down to sinners. God has come down to sinners. That Christ, through his sinless life, atoning death and hell, conquering resurrection, accomplished our redemption in full. And that we receive this redemption through the gift of faith. During this 450th anniversary of the Heidelberg Catechism, I think it's important for us to recognize how central The preaching of the word and the sacraments are in this beloved confession. And how they are never apart from the biblical and Calvinistic emphasis of the spirit working through faith. So I want us to briefly consider the means of grace as they are put forward in the Heidelberg Catechism. And specifically, how they should be constantly (coughs) kept before us in our churches. And and, and also I I want to make the point, which I'll be making uh, until until we're done here, is that the means of grace reinforce the three main divisions of the catechism. What are they? Guilt, grace, and gratitude. We see this, these divisions made in question two of the Heidelberg Catechism. What do you need to know in order to live and die in the joy of this comfort? What a huge question. What do we need to know? Answer, how great my sins and misery are. How I'm delivered from all my sins and misery. And third, how I'm to be thankful to God for such deliverance. You see, the following 127 questions and answers of the Heidelberg Catechism basically expound upon these three essential themes. Our sinful condition and misery, our deliverance in Christ, and our grateful response, which manifests itself in growing obedience. I love this threefold division of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's a wonderful summary of the Bible. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful way to evangelize. We're always looking for ways to evangelize. What a, what a great little summary. You go up, talk to someone, tell them, tell them about the condition of man, and, and, and you do that in your own way. You use some scripture, and you talk about deliverance in Christ, and you talk about what it means to be a Christian. It's a wonderful way to evangelize. Well, Ursinus actually formulated this question in his earlier smaller catechism in question three. And he asks it this way, what does God, God's word teach? What does God's word teach? Answer, it shows us our misery. Second, how we are delivered from it. And third, with gratitude ought to be shown to God. What gratitude ought to be shown to God for this deliverance? So in summary, God's word teaches us mankind's great problem, God's mind-blowing solution, and our grateful response in growing obedience. These are essential truths, friends, that God wants us to keep in front of us and ministers that God wants us to keep in front of our congregations. These are the core truths. It should be the air that we breathe in our churches, 
But Levitt, the reason why it's so critical that the means of grace stay central in the life of our churches is because when faithfully administered, they keep these core truths before us, and we need them to be. We need them to be, that we might live and die happily in Christ. Always be assured, and in ever-increasing measures, be assured of our Father's steadfast love. Well, let's begin with the preaching of the Word. And we're going to spend uh, most of our time on the preaching of the Word, and then just a few minutes on the sacraments, because so much of what I say about preaching will apply to the sacraments as well. On day one, Dr. Biema reminded us uh, from the preface of the Heidelberg Catechism that the Heidelberg Catechism was meant to serve as a guide for preaching in the Palatinate. And while there's no specific section on preaching in the Heidelberg Catechism as there is on the sacraments, we can learn from the structure and from the content of the Catechism what should characterize biblical preaching. Faithful preaching, as a means of grace, will always communicate both law and and gospel. Law and gospel. And it doesn't confuse them. In other words, faithful preaching always exposes mankind's guilt in relation to God's righteous standard, the law. And it always gives the announcement of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All sound preaching will underscore these two things. If preaching is devoid of the law, people will, get, will not really understand their great need of Christ. It will leave them yawning when you begin preaching the gospel. Why do I need why do I need him? They don't know of their need. Calvin said that God's law is like a mirror, and when we when we honestly look into the mirror of God's law, what we see reflected back to us is a rotten sinner. Someone who is full of sin, darkened in our minds, rebellious in our hearts. <coughs> Our preaching should hold up that mirror. Fellow preachers, our preaching should hold up that mirror. In Romans 3.20, we are taught that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, some of you ministers may have had this experience. You're preaching through an Old Testament book, maybe one of the minor prophets, and it's just, you just can't believe the language. It's so strong. And God is shown to be the, the, the holy, all-consuming fire that he is when it comes to sin. <clears throat> And there have been times where I've stepped out of the pulpit and yes, yes, brought the gospel home at the end and pointed them to Christ, but even still just felt, man, that was just hard. And one person after another coming through the door, overwhelmed with the love and grace of God. And do you know why? Because they got the picture of what they've been saved from. I've been saved from, from the wrath of God because Christ took upon himself the wrath of God. When people get a sense of, the, 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 of who they are before God Almighty in and of themselves, then they begin longing for that grace, don't they? And appreciating it. Heidelberg question three, which has been mentioned many times already, makes the point, from where do you know your sins and misery? Answer, out of the law of God. And the next ten questions and answers of the, of, of the Heidelberg Catechism, they expound upon the nature and the depth of our sins and guilt before God, removing any doubt that we are in great need of a Savior. Heidelberg uh, Catechism question two asks this, remember, how many things are necessary for you to know in order to live and die in the joy of discomfort? The first answer, remember, is how great your sins and misery are. How do you want to be comforted? First answer, know what a sinner you are. <laughs> Know what a sinner you are. Doesn't seem like the answer you, you, you'd want, you know, or that you'd get. This is the answer. Ursinus, in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, remarks that there are three reasons why a knowledge of our sins and misery is, are necessary for our comfort. And this has a direct application to faithful preaching, preaching as a means of grace. Number one, Ursinus says, because it excites in us the desire of deliverance. Just as a knowledge of a disease awakens a desire of medicine on the part of the sick. What's the first per thing that happens when a person gets that phone call? The test came back positive, you have cancer. I hope there's a way that I can be helped or I'm going to die. He goes on to say, where there is no knowledge of our misery, there is no deliverance sought. Just as the man who is ignorant of his disease never inquires after the physician. Point two, Osinus says, that we may be thankful to God for our deliverance. We should be ungrateful if we did not know the greatness of the evil from which we have been delivered. 
because in this case, we could not correctly estimate the magnitude of the blessing. And number three, because without the knowledge of our sinfulness and misery, we cannot hear the gospel with profit. For unless by the preaching of the law is touching sin and the wrath of God, a preparation be made for the proclamation of grace, a carnal security follows and our comfort becomes unstable. Here's the point. We must first hear how bad the bad news is before we really know how good the good news is. Isn't that right? When God's word is faithfully preached, we are reminded of the profound sinfulness of our sins and the infinite guilt that we possess before a holy God. We are taught how we come 10 million miles short of God's standard. We need to make this point. Faithful preaching holds up the mirror of God's law and shows us our true condition. <clears throat> Doesn't this only make the announcement of the gospel all that much sweeter? The gospel must always be the resounding theme of our preaching. We have not only law, we have gospel answering that law. Our preaching should be known by our heralding of the good news of the gospel that Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life as our federal head, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and as our righteous substitute, who died and was buried and then gloriously raised on the third day, thus fully and completely satisfying God's wrath and His justice and our redemption. That's a message that never gets hold. It's a message that needs to be proclaimed every Lord's Day. Friends, it's not just a message for the unsaved. It's a message for the saved. This is the point that's being made in the Heidelberg Catechism. The Apostle Paul summarized his preaching ministry in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 3 this way. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. How about Galatians 3, 1? Have you thought about this verse before? He rebukes the Galatians and says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed or placarded as crucified. What do you mean, Paul? These Galatians didn't see Jesus die on the cross. Well, Paul describes his preaching as a vivid portrayal of Christ crucified. So detailed and accurate. When they heard Paul preach, it was as if they were there at Golgotha's Hill looking up at their Savior dying. Listen to what Calvin says in his commentary on this passage in Galatians. Quote, Let those who would discharge or write the ministry of the gospel learn not merely to speak, but to penetrate into the consciences of men to make them see Christ crucified and feel the shedding of his own blood. Fellow ministers, as you're preaching, Make people feel the shedding of Christ's blood. Is is Christ so all over your preaching that it's like you're there at the cross, that your people are there at the cross? The Heidelberg Catechism not only encourages the bold and faithful preaching of the gospel by its own gospel-centered content, but as we've seen already, it makes clear that it is by the Spirit's working through the preaching of this gospel that faith is created, strengthened, and comforted. And if anybody's confused about whether or not the gospel should be preached in the Old Testament, the Heidelberg Catechism, question 19, teaches that the gospel is the golden thread that runs all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. It's to be preached, Christ is to be preached from all of Scripture. In question 19 it states that God himself first revealed the gospel in paradise. Just after the fall. Later he he had it proclaimed by the patriarchs and prophets and foreshadowed by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, he had it fulfilled through his only Son. Jesus Christ is walking throughout all the pages of the Old Testament, and he must be preached from there. Just in case any might get confused about the gospel, what it is, question 60 reminds us, how are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all God's commandments, have never kept any of them, and and am still inclined to all evil, yet God, without any, any merit of my own, out of mere grace, imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, 
He grants these to me as if I had never had nor committed any sin, and as if I myself had accomplished all the obedience which Christ has rendered for me, if only I accept this gift with a believing heart. That is what we are called to preach, ministers. Fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what our churches should be about. The preaching of the gospel, that message, that word from heaven is what God is using to call the dead to life, to raise up the valley of dry bones into a mighty army of the Lord, to save and to gather and to preserve his elect from the four corners of the earth. In this way, it is a means of grace. Now, Ursinus, on page 286 of his commentary, describes the church in this way. The church is an assemblage of persons brought together not by chance, nor in a disorderly manner, but called out of the kingdom of Satan by the voice of the Lord and by the preaching of the gospel for the purpose of hearing and embracing the word of God. Preaching is a means of grace. And so far as the Spirit uses it to expose our sin and misery and to lead us to Christ, the only one who can deliver us from the power and the penalty of our sins. And preaching, according to Heidelberg Catechism 83 and 84, is understood to be a part of the keys of the kingdom. The opening and the shutting of the doors of heaven. This is, this is stuff we don't talk about much today in our churches, but it's so important. Question 83, what are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Answer, the preaching of the holy gospel and church discipline. By these two, the kingdom of heaven is open to believers and closed to unbelievers. Matthew 16, of course. Question 84, how is the kingdom of heaven open and closed by the preaching of the gospel? Answer, according to the command of Christ, the kingdom of heaven is open when it is proclaimed and publicly testified to each and every believer that God has really forgiven all their sins for the sake of Christ's merits. As often as they by true faith accept the promise of the gospel, the kingdom of heaven is closed, however, when it is proclaimed and testified to all unbelievers and hypocrites that the wrath of God and eternal condemnation Rest on them as long as they, do, as they do not repent. According to this testimony of the gospel, God will judge both in this life and in the life to come. So here we see the profound importance of preaching as a means of grace in the Heidelberg Catechism. But there's a third thing that preaching does as a means of grace. By the Spirit, it fosters a thankful and increasingly obedient heart and life. Once again, as we've already heard this weekend, Lord's Day 24, 32 and 33, teach us that saving faith in the gospel does not make one careless and profane, but brings forth fruits of righteousness according to God's law. The law then is carefully expounded upon in Heidelberg Catechism, questions 92 to 115. And here we are exhorted as, as ministers to preach the imperatives. Here we are encouraged as, as uh, children of God to receive the imperatives, the commands of God, and to respond to them by grace, through faith, and with growing obedience. The law is a guide for the Christian life. It's not a way to earn one's salvation, but it's a way to live because salvation has already been earned for us in Jesus Christ. And so our hearts are swelled with gratefulness and you know, from time to time, I'll say to my congregation, what's the one thing you want to do when you get a view of Christ crucified for you? What's the one thing you want to do? You want to worship. Your heart, as the hymn writers say, melts with thankfulness. What's the last thing you want to do when you get a view of Christ crucified for you with your sins holding him there? The last thing you want to do is sin. You see, too often we think if we just hammer them with the law more, that then they'll conform and be obedient. And we think somehow that hammering people with the law will be actually better than lifting up Christ. But what we do, friends, is we give them the law, we show them how sinful we all are, and then we show the deliverance in Christ. We preach Christ in Him crucified, Him bleeding and dying for sinners. And as we get a view of that, we begin expounding the law, handed to us with the nail-scarred hands of Christ. The law now becomes our friend where it was that which condemned us. Now it's our friend guiding us and showing us how we can please God. 
It's, it's wonderful. It's simple. Now, while the Heidelberg Catechism doesn't have a specific section on preaching, uh, guess what does? Or science's larger catechism. I was delighted to, to see this. Um, it begins in question 268 of the larger catechism. By the way, you can access this online. Uh, there's a PDF online. Question 268, what must ministers preach? Answer, nothing but the word of God contained in the law and the gospel. You know, uh, in, in homiletics courses in RTS, I, I ask the most elementary, almost silly question after every sermon. I stand up and I say, okay, uh, friends, did he preach the Bible? Did he preach the Bible? Because the answer to that in a lot of churches these days is no. He preached, he preached himself. Or he, he, he told stories. We told everybody how cute his kids were for like 20 minutes in the sermon. That's the, that's the question. Did he preach the Bible? And her sinus, he's saying here, what should ministers preach? Nothing but the word of God contained in the law and the gospel. Question 269. And how can we be sure that the word of God is being proclaimed by ministers? Answer. If they proclaim the teaching written in the books of the Old and New Testaments. Let's make it abundantly clear. The Old and the New Testaments. And if what they say conforms to the articles of faith and the commands of God. Articles of faith meaning the Apostles' Creed. And if what they say conforms to the articles of faith and the commands of God, in short, if they teach us to seek our complete salvation in Christ alone. 270. Isn't it enough to study God's word privately? Anabaptists? Answer. It is certainly necessary for your salvation to meditate on it day and night, so they affirm private worship. But if we want to be Christians, we must also make use of the public ministry if we are not prevented by force of circumstance. So unless there's providential hindrance, we need to be under the preaching, the sound preaching of the word. Period. Full stop. Question 271. Why is this necessary? Answer. First, because of God's command. He said so. Second, so that God may be publicly praised by the whole church before all people and all creatures. Third, so that the unity of the church may be maintained and manifested. 272. What does the Holy Spirit bring about through the preaching of God's word? First, he teaches what God promises us in his covenant and what he requires from us in turn. Second, he persuades us more and more each day to believe and to obey him. Question 273, finally, and how does the Holy Spirit work in us through hearing and meditating on God's word? Answer, we learn the word of God with the result that we believe and obey him in all things. In all things. So we can easily see how preaching is a means of grace in the Heidelberg Catechism, a means through which Christ is building and strengthening his church, a means by which he is giving us a knowledge of our sin and misery, a knowledge of deliverance in Christ, and a knowledge of a life of grateful and growing obedience that we are called to joyfully embrace. You know, if I can shoot forward a couple of centuries, Charles Simeon, the great preacher from Cambridge, he, he summarized uh, the goal of preaching all faithful preaching is this. It should humble the sinner, exalt the Savior, and promote holiness. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? There's no doubt that this is the intention of the catechism. But we must, must also briefly mention the sacraments. This will be brief. We see the sacraments introduced in questions 66 through 68, and then each sacrament is expounded upon in questions 69 through 82. I wish we had time to, to unpack all of the really fascinating uh, history that is behind this section on the sacraments, and, and in particular on the Lord's Supper. Um, serious drama going on, historically. Uh, you can make a movie out of the, the Lord's Supper. It might be kind of boring <coughs> to some people, but really you can make a, a, a movie of what is going on in the background between the, uh, in, in Frederick III's family and... and um, amongst all the Nisio lutherans and the battle between the Nisio lutherans and the Reformed over this doctrine. Uh, but for now, uh, I want to show that these are a means of grace, both baptism and the Lord's Supper. Like preaching, they reinforce the themes or divisions of the catechism, guilt, grace, and gratitude. Look at question 69 with me. It says, How does holy baptism signify and seal to you that one sacrifice of Christ on the cross uh, benefits you. How does holy baptism signify and seal to you that the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross benefits you? Answer, 
In this way, Christ instituted this outward washing and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away dirt from the body, now listen, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away the impurity, or in some uh, translations, the pollution of my soul. That is all my sins. Right here, what's being reinforced? The pollution of our souls, the knowledge of our sin. Our baptisms remind us of that. And our baptisms are not just a once for all. We get baptized and then that's it. Baptism is meant to be a means of grace our whole lives long. We are to remember that we are baptized. We are set apart. God has has marked us with his promise of grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. And so our baptism is always making us look away from ourselves and to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his cleansing blood. We get in the shower, we wash off the dirt and the grime from our bodies. It's a picture of baptism. It's a picture of, of, of Christ and what he has done for us. Also here, of course, we see the deliverance and we see the call to holiness in baptism as well. In question 70, what does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? Answer, to be washed with Christ's blood means to receive forgiveness of sins from God through grace because of Christ's blood poured out for us in his sacrifice on the cross. Can it get any clearer than that? What baptism represents, signifies, and seals to us. And then it goes on to say this in, in answer 70, to be washed with his spirit means to be renewed by the Holy Spirit and sanctified to be members of Christ so that more and more we become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. How much clearer can you get that this means of grace shows us the pollution of our souls apart from Christ, shows us the deliverance and salvation in Christ through the the cleansing blood of Christ, which brings forgiveness and mercy to us, through faith, and also that life that baptism calls us to, dying to sin, living to Christ in ever-increasing measure. We move on to the Lord's Supper, questions 75 through 82. There's far too much to deal with here, but we can see in question and answer 81, all three emphases of the Heidelberg Catechism are stated. Our sin, Christ's deliverance, and our call to holiness. And as you read over, I'll encourage you to read over this section of the Lord's Supper. If you've never read, first of all, if you've never read the Heidelberg Catechism straight through, it's a great exercise. Just sit down one Lord's Day afternoon and read straight through all 129 questions and answers. It is a marvelous exercise. Look up some of the the proof texts uh, for the, um, the statements. You'll see that it's just a marvelous summary of the Christian life and the call uh, to what we ought to um, respond to, the gospel. Finally, I want to say this. We must keep the means of grace central in our churches. Why? Because it gives us, number one, a right perspective on ourselves. It's the theology of the cross. It's always remembering who we are. Always remembering who we must rely upon, who we must be dependent upon. It's an act of faith to recognize who we are as sinners who need grace. When the means of grace are set forth and the word is properly preached and the sacraments are properly administered and received, we are constantly reminded that we are sinners. And so we must be patient with one another. Forgiving others as God has forgiven us. It, 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 it cultivates humility in our hearts. We look not to be successful in our churches, but faithful. And if God brings some measure of success in this life, we'll praise Him for that. But our goal is to be faithful. And we have a right perspective on ourselves. Secondly, again, it gives us a glorious view of Christ and the gospel. Is this not what we want every Lord's Day? You know, if you're like me, you go through your week and you just can't wait to get to the service and to receive the, the ordinances. Lord, tell me again. Do you ever get tired of hearing, men, do you ever get tired of hearing your wife tell you that she loves you? Of course you don't. 
You ever get tired of hearing God that he loves you? God loves you. Not just God loves you, plural, but God loves you personally. <clears throat> tell me again. Father, tell me again that you love me after all that I've done. After all the things that I've said, after the way that I cursed you for years on the soccer field. The people that I hurt. All the sins that I've committed. All the dirty, terrible thoughts that I had. Still sometimes have. All the sins I've committed. All the sins that I will commit. Tell me again that you love me in Christ despite all those things. That you've forgiven me. That I stand before you now by grace through faith, justified in your sight that I'm your child. Tell me again you love me. That's what the means of grace do. And we need them to be central. Thirdly, they foster a heart of grateful and growing obedience. That's why we need to keep them central in our churches. Pastors, you want a growing congregation, growing spiritually, God willing, growing numerically, then set forth the means of grace in a robust way, faithfully, with instruction. Fourthly, they communicate grace to us. They do this. God, as I said before, is at work through these means. And so we must believe that promise. Even when there's not a lot of external fruit to be seen through numerical growth, we stick to it. You say something like this, Lord, this ship may be going down, but it's going to go down on your terms. We're not going to keep it afloat on my terms. I will trust you with these means that you have attached your promises to and that you have promised to bless. Fifthly, by giving us by giving us these things, we are able, according to the Heidelberg Catechism, to live and die in the joy of the comfort of Christ. By giving us the word and sacraments, we are able to be comforted and encouraged in what the Heidelberg Catechism calls this life, a valley of tears. What comfort it brings. When the word is properly preached, the sacraments are rightly administered, we gain comfort in this valley of tears, and we are assured that our Heavenly Father has our best interests in mind. I'll never forget, in my former congregation, one of my elders, he had had prostate cancer, and then and he has regular checkups, as, as, as you do, and every year, and then well, about a year ago, he went to get his tests, and his PSA count had shot up. And you know, he began to worry. He's thinking about his wife and his, his kids and his grandkids, and he's overwhelmed. Didn't really show that a whole lot until I heard afterwards what happened. He had come to the church service a bit overwhelmed and anxious. And the gospel was preached, and then he came to the Lord's table, and he was weeping. as the bread and wine were being passed to him. And afterwards, he said, Pastor John, I was so overwhelmed with the sense that God loves me and everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And do you know when the means of grace are set forth, that's the resounding message? God is our Father. He has our best interests in mind. Everything's going to be okay in this valley of tears. So, I exhort all of us this morning, to come to the means of grace with joyful expectation. Come exercising your faith in Christ. Come fleeing from sin. Come embracing all of the benefits that are yours in Christ. They are yours in Christ. Embrace them. The Lord's Day is the market day of the soul. Let us as ministers be faithful to give this to our people and not something so much less, which is ourselves. May we become less. May Christ become more as we set forth the means of grace. Let us plumb into the depths of the gospel by studying what the means of grace are and what they are meant to do for you and in you by the Spirit through faith. Friends, the best enemy of the best is the good. And we are coming up with so many good things in our churches. But it's just marginalizing the best, which is Christ. When we have the means of grace set forward, we have Christ. And so Christ is gathering, feeding, protecting, disciplining, guiding, and keeping his sheep through these means.
may this be a part of the church's identity. And may we not be like those builders' sons who thought they knew best. Let's change a little bit here. Let's change a little bit there. Let's, let's, let's move that room off there. Let's put something different. Now let's follow the blueprint and trust God for the, what he has promised to bless. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the Heidelberg Catechism and the way that it reinforces and summarizes how important the means of grace are for the church and for our lives individually. Lord, help us as ministers to be faithful uh, to administer these, to be faithful to preach the word and to administer the sacraments with instruction. And Lord God, we ask that we would follow the blueprint that you have set forth in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.